Welcome to Computer Science E1. My name is David Malin, and it was about seven years ago when I first uttered those words. It was February of 1999 when I took over this course. And back then, there, there were no streaming videos, really. It's certainly not in the popularity that they are today. There was no podcast. Uh, there was no distance ed. There was VHS. So back in the day, we used to film these lectures on VHS so that students, not abroad and so forth, could watch them, but so that our own students, if they missed a lecture or wanted to catch up, they could actually review the tape. Um, and it was kept in the, down the hallway in the library. The um, funny thing back then is we didn't throw many resources into these VHS tapes, and we would have the teaching fellows uh, rotate through each week and each week film one of the lectures. And uh, you know, back then, it was mostly my friends who were teaching fellows for the course, since I was an undergraduate at the time. And uh, we have a lot of videos where the camera is doing a really nice job during part of the lecture, and then zoom, when the TF, or cameraman, would fall asleep. So uh, our Chris Mel has done a much better job in recent years of filming us, but I thought, uh, if you'll indulge me down this uh, walk down memory lane, I thought I'd give you a few seconds of what this class was like in 1999. Here we go. All right, let's stop it repeating there. Um, let me just tweak this microphone for a moment. Can everyone in here in the back hear me all right? Yeah, any need for more? Okay. Welcome to Computer Science E1, Introduction to Personal Computers and the Internet. My name is David Malin, and I will be your instructor for this semester. Some of you may recall a woman's name, uh, Laura Noble Peel, on the original course catalog. She has since moved to Minnesota, and I've been asked to take over the course in her stead. But I promise this semester you will have a fantastic time and by the semester's end we'll walk away with a firm grasp of both what computers are as well as what the internet is. Before we begin, let me take a quick survey of people. How many people here actually have a computer at home? If you could raise your hands. That's fantastic because it will make our lives easier. Um, how many people, and it's okay to raise your hand to this one, have never actually used a computer before? There's no shame in this. Okay, that's fantastic. This course will be... So everything was fantastic back then, apparently. Um, and I don't think I was ever as nervous as I was that week. I probably didn't eat for days before that class, because I was still, I was a senior at the time, and as uh, that guy said, Laura Noble Peel, who was the original architect of this course, a boss of mine at FAS Computer Services, whom I worked for as an undergrad, had invented this course, probably in 1997 or so. And before this, at Harvard Extension at least, there really was no introductory course, no survey course. There really was no entry point for folks who either wanted to pursue somewhat technical academic programs, or even just wanted to get some more savvy for their own personal edification. So this course really is the result of her vision way back when. And she moved unexpectedly partway through the year, um, and a gentleman took over for about a, a semester or so, Bill Barthelmy, who was the second instructor for this course. And he, too, did a wonderful job um, bringing the course closer to what it now is today. And it was in the spring of 1999 that he decided to step down and focus on his full-time job at FAS Computer Services. And they tapped me, this little old uh, uh, Harvard undergrad, who uh, at the time we kept it very quiet as to uh, the fact that not only was I the youngest kid in the room, I was also the only one without a degree at the time. Um, that's why you see me dressing in suits, and I even had suspenders on under that suit at the time. I wore glasses. I did everything I could to come across as something far older than I was, and I bought myself a few years, and these days now, you know, this is, I mean, Dawn was surprised to see me tonight, because I think I've let myself go since with jeans and t-shirts in class and so forth, so I thought I'd spice it up a little bit tonight. Um, the point, though, is that this is the 11th time that I've taught this course, and it's been wonderful. Um, this is the last time that I'll teach this course, so this is the final E1 lecture that I will ever give, um, and for me, that's why I've probably not been nervous in this class since the first lecture of this year. I'm always nervous the first lecture, since I don't know anyone in the room, really, and it's kind of intimidating seeing all these fresh faces staring, literally staring down at you in this lecture hall. And unfortunately, by lecture two, I realized that y'all are pretty much okay. Um, but tonight, what I'd like to do with us is, one, take a look back at where we this semester started the course, um, take a look forward as to where you might go academically, just with technology in the future, certainly say a few thank yous to those who have helped out in the class, and also just give you a sense of what you yourselves have been a part of, particularly with respect to the course's podcast. So without further ado, we have, over the years, tried a number of experiments in this class. Oh, and uh, 
There are a lot of little things tonight that I've tried to intersperse that really make sense only to me. This, for instance, was the very first song that was played in Ewan at that very first lecture, so I thought it would be apropos for me at least to hear it again. Um, but with that said, we've tried a number of experiments in this class. The one of which you are probably most familiar with is this guy, the podcast that we've been dabbling in for the past year or two. And that's been one of the fun things about this course, is over the past several years we've tried a number of tools, techniques, ideas with which to familiarize our own students with technology and computers, make them more part of the course so that I'm not just some talking head at the front of the course, but rather the students themselves and beyond just workshops and sections are actually engaging either intellectually or um, hands-on with some of these technologies. We tried, for instance, way back when, when the course had a, a different website, a sort of, you know that the course website now has that resources page with links. Those are pretty much these days links sanctioned by us. Well, there was a time where students themselves could post to that web page links that they like to frequent, post a little description for them um, so that their fellow students could see what kinds of links other people were making use of. And you have to realize too, back in 1999, though it'd be cute to say that there was no internet back then and there were no computers. There certainly were, but certainly not it, to the extent that there are today. And there were certainly m several hands that first night in 99 that went up that said, I don't even own a computer. We had a couple of people who had never used a computer, and we had people certainly who had never used the internet. And it really was a different audience. And the course has had to change over the years such that these days, pretty much all of you came into this course with some savvy with computers. Maybe a bit of a fear factor. Maybe you weren't quite the type who could problem solve technical problems on your own, but odds are you were using a computer nonetheless eight hours a day at work or at night at home or you had some basic skills. So the course has certainly adapted over the years. Well that one experiment where students could post their own links to the website, absolute failure. No one ever did it. So we put it aside and we tried something else. We had a course listserv for a number of years. A listserv is just a, an email list. We put all the students on it and we invited them to talk with one another, post questions, post answers, discuss things on the listserv. That too, complete failure. Never really worked. We tried using the listserv last year in a last ditch effort to breathe some life into it from requiring that students for those movie reviews, if they wanted to uh, get extra credit on a problem set, they'd have to share their thumbs up or thumbs down, not only with us, but with the class on the listserv. The only emails that ever went out on the listserv were movie reviews. So it didn't really speak to its uh, academic value. So we scrapped that. We, for uh, several years, used a system called the Personal Response System, PRS, um, which essentially are these little infrared-based remote controls, which we fondly called clickers. These were not so much a failure. We don't use them terribly much these days, but imagine, if you will, an experiment in which all of you had these little remote controls in your hands. Uh, on these controls is a keypad from one to, uh, 1 to 9 and 0 and a couple of other buttons, and we used these for a number of semesters to engage students in Q&A sort of anonymous Q&A, such that if I posed a question in multiple choice form, we could survey the students by way of these clickers and they would buzz in with answer one or two or three or four, and then we had some neat graphing software that would show us how many students guessed A, how many, or one, how many students guessed two, how many students guessed three, and it was always fun, of course, because though it was anonymized, we could always make fun of the students who you know, were in the wrong bucket on the screen. And that was sort of an attempt to get students to um, you'll be a little less um, hesitant to answer questions, right? Raising your hand, especially if you feel like you know less than everyone else in the room, is kind of a scary thing, especially if you're wrong. And, you know, I make light of that after the fact. So we use these clickers, and those worked well. Um, I'm not convinced they have particular pedagogical value as much as they have entertainment and sort of fun value, um, but nonetheless we use those for quite a while. And usually, we didn't do it this year, we used to, uh, even that project we began to use just to vote for mouse pads every year. So you would buzz in for your mouse pad choice, but this year we did it the old fashioned way on paper pencil. So the short of it is this class, not only in having students uh, acquainted with a whole bunch of material, we've also tried to experiment with a lot of technologies, and the most current of which, and dare say the most successful of which, for our own students and beyond, we think, has been this podcast. So it was around fall 2005 in September when um, podcasts really were just starting to catch on. This is just over a year ago. They'd sort of existed under that name or others for quite some time, perhaps. I mean, at the end of the day, what's a podcast? It's just like a feed of MP3s 
Now movies, PDFs, right? It was just a marketing term, really. It was just a buzzword around something you could have been doing for years. But it began to gain traction. And this term, podcast, sort of came my way. And, you know, truth be told, I think I said to Ray in last August, maybe, last September 2005, you know, hey, Ray, let's, let's podcast E1 this year. And then I think five minutes later, after I finished talking with Ray, I went on, with Ray, I went on Google and I looked up what a podcast was. Um, and Wikipedia gave a very nice definition of what it was I had just committed us to. Um, at the time, we were only podcasting in audio. So I had, in addition to these wires, yet another device, an MP3 recorder that was recording everything I said. We used it in some sections and workshops, and we posted that material on the web not only, and in iTunes and the podcast for students in the course to download. And it was also just publicly accessible if anyone else wanted to sort of see what this class was up to. Well, around last October or November, Apple released the video iPod. And we quickly went back and re-digitized all of our videos in QuickTime format using an MPEG-4 codec so that we could also distribute the videos of the course as well. Uh, that landed me for a while in the provost's office because uh, we had a nice little discussion with the powers that be as to what it meant to be podcasting courses at Harvard Extension School or at Harvard in general. And uh, everything certainly worked out um, for the best in the end, but it certainly raised a whole bunch of issues that even other universities are continuing to consider and to discuss as to exactly one, what the value of technology like this is, opening a university's doors, whether this one or Harvard Extension or any other school, to the public at large, as well as to its own students. And also, two, just, you know, maybe they should be doing this in the first place. And I've sort of come around to thinking with these kinds of technologies, especially when we have so much information being uttered in classrooms like this and others at this school and others, that it perhaps could be one of the most significant things for universities to start doing to opening their doors virtually to the world, not only in the US, but other countries, and just making available at relatively low cost what is already being produced in some of um, this country, certainly, um, dominant universities. I think it's a powerful thing, and for that reason alone, I think it's been exciting to sort of be pushing the envelope or getting ourselves in trouble at times just to see exactly where something like this might go. With that said, I thought it would be fun to reveal to you some of what you've been yourselves involved with and what your past semester student body were involved with. This podcast, again, was launched in September of 2005. To give you a sense of what Log suggests subscribership has been to this podcast, certainly not just within our, among our own students, but in the um, world at large, this is a chart showing the number of downloads, so far as we can tell from logs that we've maintained, as to how many times each lecture or workshop was downloaded, in either MP3 or uh, QuickTime format. And you'll see that lecture one, for instance, last year, log suggests was downloaded over a 12-month period over 10,000 times. Um, things like lectures three and four and workshop four and eight sort of average out or um, sort of reach equilibrium about 8,000. So we actually suspect that last year's podcast had, again, not just in our own um, walls, but about a subscribership, six to 10,000 people who tuned in to the class that you folks have been tuning into in this particular year, which was quite remarkable because certainly at the time we had no expectation as to really there being any benefits or any interest in the outside public. For us, for Ray and I, when we discussed this way back when, the value was just in letting students, if they missed a class or wanted to review a class, be able to review that class or watch it or listen to it for the first time without, honestly, the, you know, it's, it's all relative, but the inconvenience of having to sit down at their computer and watch a streaming video or listen to a streaming audio cast, right? We've come a long way from VHS and just putting this stuff online was a huge marginal gain probably for students in terms of convenience. Well, when you start to get used to things like iPods and wireless internet access, it it actually becomes, I think, a virtual tether if to engage in this kind of material you have to be physically online or you have to be streaming a relative, on a relatively slow connection, the data. And so really what this podcast was for us was just a marginal change, a marginal improvement perhaps on the media that we were providing our own students with already. So they, they could listen on the subway to their MP. I mean, <laughs> frankly, it's a whole other question as to why you'd want to be listening to computer science on an iPod in the first place. So let me disclaim that. I, you know, I'm not sure I would watch myself on an iPod or an iTunes or whatnot. So that much I concede. I think the value is in the technology, not so much the guy in the technology. But with that said, um, 
it simply gives students options and it gives them another angle, another means of access to courses content like this. Numbers we also looked at last year between 05 and 06 were where people were coming from. Most subscribers appear to be coming from the United States, just over half, but we had folks from Germany, Australia, Japan, Canada, the United Kingdom, and then a whole bunch of other countries who made up a smaller percentage, but there were over 50 countries represented in the log so far as we could tell. This year, as we mentioned um, a few months ago, we had some serious bandwidth problems. Fall semester 06 began and we crippled the Extension School server and were nicely asked to leave the Extension School server. Um, so we turned to outside resources and when we began looking at the logs, this is November 06, so just a few months ago, and December 06, just a month ago, we had experienced downloads on the order of just shy of four terabytes in November and over five terabytes of data were downloaded from the podcast in December. Now you have to consider that these videos themselves are large, so they're two to three hundred megabytes, so these numbers, while big, you sort of have to divide by a you know, 10 or 100 to get a sense of the magnitude, but even so, when you consider how many individual people were downloading the content, it seems again to be in the thousands, and I'll show you a couple numbers in just a moment. This I thought is um, less related to the podcast, more just fun with logs, as we suggested in our security lecture, I looked at the key phrases that people have apparently been typing in to Google and Yahoo and so forth to find E1 or find its podcast or at least content like it. And apparently, and perhaps not surprising, if you type in lecture and internet, somewhere along the way E1's podcast will come up in your favorite search engine. Also our log suggested that people had found us via Harvard lecture, seems reasonable as well. So police dog training. <laughs> apparently leads to Computer Science at U1's podcast. So go figure. Uh, Harvard Extension School Problem Set 4. I dare say that was one of you looking for your Problem Set 4, given how specific it was. Upgrading a PC similarly leads to us. And no joke, and mind you, this is the censored version of what I'm showing you. Apparently, for great sex, you can come to Computer Science E1. Apparently, for, we've got some videos floating around that maybe I'm not aware of. Um, but those are among the search terms that apparently lead to E1's podcast. So what have um, the specific downloads been like? Well, here's a graph of just the last three weeks of November 06, so just a month or two ago, and Eugenia's workshop number eight currently, according to logs, has the distinction of being the most popular content downloaded in November with about 2,200 people downloading that particular content. And again, you have to take some of these numbers with a grain of salt because we can only infer from the logs, but that seems to be a reasonable lower bound on the number of times these were downloaded. Dan's workshop, number 10, uh, was clocked in around 16 or 1,700 downloads. And I hope these two are beaming that they completely trounced uh, David Malin's lectures, which were the three least popular downloads in November of 06. Uh, but there we have lectures eight, seven, and nine. And to look in December had similar results. Eugenia was hot in December as well with her workshop number 11 with over 3,000 downloads. The TF's review, there's a pattern here, right? The TF's review number two uh, came in just shy of 3,000 downloads in December 06 alone. And then whoever it was doing lectures 12, 11, 10, and 1 um, was in last place in December as well. So that's great. Um, and it's sort of, what's amazing to be honest is just these numbers. The fact that as a side effect of our interest in just engaging our own students in you know, tetherless iPods and iTunes and so forth for the course's content, that it's had this sort of effect or this fringe benefit of others tuning in as well and finding their way not only to this class and asking us, hey, how can I enroll next semester, but also just to Extension and some of the other courses that have begun this experiment as well. Finally, just to uh, make sure these guys uh, are, are properly recognized for their popularity on YouTube, where some of these videos have been as well. Dan's uh, video of the week from volume four, TCPIP, has had over a thousand downloads on YouTube alone. Dan's volume two, Browser Wars, uh, has clocked in, in over 2,000 uh, downloads. And then Ray's installing Windows XP, similarly popular on YouTube as well. So um, it's remarkable, and we share these not so much to more out of, certainly, more out of amazement as to what has happened with this experiment than certainly out of 
of pride or anything like that. So we hope we offer these just as data to sort of um, offer you a, a sense of what you yourselves have been involved with or the project that you have been involved with. So none of this certainly would have been possible without these four folks uh, today. And what we're about to do is going to sound like we're winding down to a thank you and good night, but there's more to come, right? We clearly have something to do here tonight, and we've got a retrospective as well, but I wanted to take a moment before we go on too long to recognize these four faces, who look much prettier in person, right? I blew up very small JPEGs, and you know from your multimedia lecture why they look so bad on the screen at this resolution, because it's only like 46 pixels across, and I blew it up. But also listed here on the board are teaching fellows past who have been involved with the course since February of 1999. And if you would uh, indulge me with a round of applause for these four. Um, <laughs> you and take a I'll say a quick word about each of them, if I may. Ray Diaz has been involved with this course now for several years, and it was uh, two years ago, that mid-semester, Ray uh, took on the gargantuan task of filling in for a few teaching fellows who, sec who were no longer able to continue with the course, and so we had holes in the schedule of two sections. So Ray stepped up and literally began teaching three sections simultaneously, and I, I wish I hadn't used the moniker back then, but he was presented with back then a, a, a plastic Superman doll, which sort of captured the fact that he really was a Superman that semester, and he's certainly done an outstanding job since as, as the continued head teaching fellow. Uh, Eugenia has been with us this year, and she is the result of Several months. We started honestly recruiting for teaching fellows months ago, right? Because it's much easier to do this over a period of time and sort of ideally have your pick of folks. And we posted to various sites locally at Harvard, at MIT, Craigslist, really anywhere we could think of where we might reach out to some technical folks. And Eugenia was the result of a, a several month search. And we've been thrilled, certainly, that she said yes to our offer and has uh, both been teaching and learning, we think, along the way with us. So thank you for that as well. Uh, Dan Armendariz has been with the course for a couple of semesters now. Dan and I met at uh, MIT, where we were both EMTs, emergency medical technicians, riding ambulances and such, that we never together rode the ambulance. Um, that makes it sound much sexier than it really was. We met because at the time of being EMTs, which is factually correct, I was also the webmaster for MIT's emergency medical services, and Dan was the guy who took over the website for MIT EMS. So it's not nearly as cool when you say you met because of a website, but we were officially at the time EMTs. He's been with the course for two years now and is certainly our unofficial and official Mac guy, and the guy, as you've seen during lecture, I'll turn to and ask questions of when I don't know the answer. Um, and he too has been fantastic to have on the team for the past couple of years. Um, finally, Chris Thayer hasn't officially been on the team, but has sort of become on the team over the past several months. Chris is a former student, so she was part of Paul 2005 and all of that. Um, she has this semester volunteered way more hours than probably any of us have put into the course ourselves in helping with our video production. So the video of the week project that we took on with the support of the university producing some 60 videos of the week that will continue to remain available uh, after the course's end if you haven't even had time to dabble in that content has uh, certainly been furthered along with hours and <laughs> hundreds of emails that I've gotten at 2 and 3 a.m. Um, from Chris who originally was just volunteering her own time just to help out with this video project. And so much of the videos that you've seen this semester would not have been possible without her as well. So if you'll indulge me once more, just a round of applause for these four. Thank you so much. Um, this is going to sound like the Academy Awards for just a moment, but uh, Chris Mell, who's the man who you never see in front of the camera but is always behind the camera, has been wonderful to work with over the past few years, right? When we finally got rid of the sleeping teaching fellows and started using professionals to film the course, the videos have been fantastic. And of all the videographers we've worked with at Extension, Chris is awesome. Honestly, this man here, we, we personally request him via email each semester because not only does he just film the lectures, which is one thing, and he doesn't fall asleep, which is also to his credit, he really, if you watch the videos, and maybe though I'm talking to the wrong crowd tonight given that you're physically here, but he really gets into it and does a really nice job, I think, of capturing what's going on down here when, when Dawn is up volunteering some evening, 
um, capturing what's on the screen, and just really giving a good video experience. And we hope we've, you've appreciated that as well. Behind the scenes, Chris Barnhart is the woman who does our post-production, who takes the videotapes that Chris makes each week, puts them into machines, and does her magic, and out comes some real videos, and the synchronization of slides, and so forth. So she too, um, and I'm hoping she actually watches these videos, and doesn't just fast forward through us, because she'll too get this thank you from us. A few other people, if I may, and then I, I got some juicy stuff for you here tonight. Uh, if you haven't seen um, Wired Magazine by way of uh, author Jeff Howe was kind enough to make mention of E1 in its podcast and its December issue. And we're very grateful, certainly, for the comments and the attention that he further brought to E1's podcast. Um, Victor Cajajo, who was our... Uh, uh, guest lecture, if you will, when we did that Skype demonstration and you had that huge face beaming down at you on this 20-foot screen via video conference. Victor is a fellow who's had his own podcasts for a while. Uh, the currently um, most germane to the course is his typical Mac user podcast in which he takes questions and gives answers and generally just talks about what it's like to be a Mac user, converting to be a Mac user. And early on last year, he was wonderful in just drumming up attention for E1's podcast and really helping us get the podcast out there. And for that, we are certainly grateful. Finally, in the commercial end, uh, Jake Fisher at SwitchPod.com. SwitchPod is a startup, um, started a couple of years ago, and I don't quote me on this, but from my own research, Jake, I believe, is 16 or 17 years old now. He was one of these crazy kids who starts a company in his, uh, in his parents' home or dorm room, um, sells it to another company, and what you have here is SwitchPod.com, which has been generous enough to host our podcast gratis for the past several months and help us sort of deal with the thousands of downloads that you've seen. And it was Victor who referred us to Jake, so we too are grateful to Jake. Um, here's where I'll wave my hand and not bore you with the academy type speech, but there's a whole bunch of people who have been instrumental in making this course possible from 1999 until now. And thank you again for indulging me in this. Thank you to all of them. Um, this is most of them. Um, I'm sure I forgot one or more people, but the beauty of the internet and PDFs and podcasts is that I'll just go change the document when I realize I've forgotten someone and put them back in retroactively. Finally, literally, finally, Dr. Henry Leitner. So this is effectively my boss. He was my, uh, one of my CS professors as an undergrad. Um, Henry Leitner, he's one of the deans at Harvard Extension School um, and is really one of those people. I don't know if you all have found one of these people in your life. I was sort of surprised that it happened to me already that really influences you and gives you your chance and takes risks on you. And I'm sure it was kind of a crazy thing at the time when he quietly had some kid filling in for Bill Barthelmy when he stepped down to take over E1, but he took a chance on me. And for 11 semesters since, I've been um, lucky enough to uh, continue to be brought on for this course. And it is to Henry that I'm eternally grateful. He's one of those guys where, you know, I started off as an undergrad as a Gov major, which maybe is fitting if people who like to hear themselves talk, as we apparently are doing tonight, um, but eventually changed to computer science. And it was the only reason, I think, that I ended up with involved with E1 or even teaching in general was because I ran for um, student government at Harvard and lost, and lost really badly. And I remember all too vividly the elections debate, one of these debates where it was me and a bunch of other sophomores or juniors, um, you know, all dressed up like this in some Harvard-esque har lecture hall and debating each other over like the quality of food in the dining hall and why there are no parties on campus and these kinds of things. And I did horribly. Like, it was embarrassing how poorly I spoke and how poorly I presented myself. And I don't know if this is the typical solution, but I decided to fix this um, by teaching. So <laughs> I was an awful speaker, so I decided if I started pursuing teaching fellows roles, um, I was one of the TFs for E1 when, Laura taught, uh, when Bill taught it in 1998, in the fall thereof, and I sort of use that as the motivation to get in to all this. So it's sort of funny, I think, just to look back on little incidents like that where you make one relatively simple decision or mistake even, and it kind of influences things along the way. But none of this would have happened without Henry. So thank you for indulging me in these past many minutes of uh, retrospectives. And now, welcome to Computer Science E1. This is lecture 14, exciting conclusion. So over the past several months, we have looked at a whole range of topics, and bear in mind that one of the first pictures you saw upon uh, arriving at Lecture 1 or downloading Lecture 1 was a PDF containing a picture of a hack at MIT. 
Does anyone remember what this picture of an MIT hack was? Yeah. Water thingy? <laughs> Water fountain, yes. So years ago, as MIT is popular for, one of their hacks was to have some clever kids connect a fire hose, working as I understand it, to a water fountain, and then tacked on the wall just above this, recall, was a sign along the lines of getting an education at MIT is like drinking water from a fire hose. And we've sort of usurped the idea, the spirit of that hack, and tried to warn you on page two or so of the syllabus that there's just a huge amount of content in this particular course. And it is certainly our expectation and our understanding that if some of that went this way, like that was to be expected. And certainly by courses end here, even if you didn't get 100 on exam one or two, even if you're thinking MIT hack, what was that? That's OK. It wasn't all supposed to go down. But what hopefully you'll exit this course with is just, even if it's a marginal bit more confidence that, heck, if you don't know the answer to something, if you're not sure how something works, you know half a dozen websites you can go check. You know half a dozen people you can go ask. You know a half a dozen tricks, internet keyword searches, and so forth that you can use to solve those problems or those questions on your own. Among the things we did in lecture one was focus on hardware. Um, we didn't really talk about these, but these are sort of toys that I have in my apartment that are germane to hardware, including this newest, sexiest of telephones, the BlackBerry Pearl. And I offer this one is just a, originally this slide contained uh, binary numbers. And we were going to do a little exercise in what were these binary numbers? Do you remember the binary numbers we did with, uh, it was light bulbs, and there were five rows, and then we spelled out 90210, and then I played the 90210. We've done that too many times. I think it's, it wasn't funny the first time either, perhaps. So hardware, what's the, the relevance of this stuff? It's the omnipresence of it. We talk in this course early on, certainly, about hardware at its most basic level, bits. And we talk about registers and CPUs. And ultimately, we spend more time talking about laptops and desktops. But the fact of the matter is, and this is no, not a surprise, Computers and technology and the sort of stuff we explore in this course really is all around these days, such that the cell phones we all have, most likely in this lecture hall, are little computers. For years have your cars had computers in them. The TiVo is just a Linux box with a sexy interface on top of it that lets you save TV shows as they're broadcast. The Slingbox, which we've used before lecture a lot, is just a little computer that uses some type of uh, multimedia codec to take a video feed, quickly wrap it up in like some MPEG like codec and then stream it out on the internet. So already here we have the notion of an operating system meeting Linux and hardware. We have the notion of streaming. We have the notion of um, MPEG like compression. We have the notion of, um, how can we tie this in, wireless <laughs> internet connectivity. Um, and just the fact that it is a little computer. And uh, I won't ask that you indulge me in playing with this phone, but it really is the coolest thing. You can get Google Maps on this. You can look up the internet. I'll be sitting at dinner lately, and if some random question comes up, I'm the geek at the table who's like, I'll answer this. And then type into Wikipedia or Google some question, and we get the answer immediately on demand. But the point is that pretty much everything we talk about in this course still applies to all of this hardware. Inside of all of these devices are bits in some form, are registers, are pieces of memory, flash memory, ROM. All of that continues to be present in even today's most advanced devices. Just released yesterday was the Apple iPhone. And if you didn't see the announcement already, go to apple.com after class or pull up CNN or MSNBC. Everybody's talking about this thing. This is a new cell phone that'll be out in June or so of this year. Um, it is entirely touch-based. So there are very few buttons on this thing, and pretty much the whole menu interface that Steve Jobs demoed yesterday um, at Macworld is about showing you what you can do on this particular screen. And there's some neat little effects. And what this really is, is sort of a nice marriage between good hardware, fast hardware, and increasingly well-designed software, the aim of which is to just make these things easier to use. The point Steve Jobs made yesterday in the keynote that some of us were watching tonight before class was that you know even just to call, it is hard. My mom hates it when I use her in examples, but this is the last time I'll do it. For me to pick out a cell phone even, for someone like my mother who just wants a phone to make calls, doesn't need anything fancy, just wants to be able to call, and make calls, and receive calls, it's really hard to go into a place like Verizon, T-Mobile, any of these guys, and pick a simple phone. Even I sometimes get frustrated, more so with my last phone, to do simple tasks 
is very hard. And I think this is largely a function not so much of the fact that my mom's not a computer science major, the fact that you might not be a computer science major. It's because the computer science majors who design the things did it poorly. And so hopefully one of the takeaways you'll get from this course is that if you are struggling with something technological, it is, dare say, as much, if not more, the fault of someone else, honestly, than it is of you. And hopefully you'll walk away with a sense that that is, in fact, true. Testament to this notion of increasingly, uh, increasingly well-designed software, Google Earth, I think is a brilliant example of something that's pretty easy to use. It's certainly pretty to use, and it really seems to do a lot. Even if right now it seems to be more of a novelty, sort of a fun way of taking a virtual vacation, already people are developing applications that use Google Earth. For instance, uh, I think I saw something recently like a, a where in the world is Carmen San Diego like a game running on top of Google Earth. And what better way to sort of allow a kid or an adult to explore the world than to literally make accessible all of that information in what's really a nice interface. And so what Google is certainly good at besides search, I think is presenting some really novel and really appreciated interfaces. Google Maps, right? We've had MapQuest, we've had Yahoo Maps for years. Google Maps, I think, is the best. And it's the most recent one. You wouldn't have thought, perhaps, that this is a market that you should bother entering since people already do this. But you can click and drag. And you can scroll. You can look at the satellite imagery. And it's these marginal improvements that I think people are finally beginning to appreciate as technology becomes the domain, not so much of geeks like us, but of everybody, that you really have to appreciate that you don't need to be or shouldn't need to be a technophile to make a phone call or to look something up on the internet. Well, lecture three, recall, was we call it software, but we really just put a DVD in the drive and hit play, which is kind of a cop out when it comes to talking about software. But software sort of laced throughout the course anyway, that it doesn't bother us so much. What I did insert into this, our, our conclusion, is <laughs> some of the um, all too familiar indicators of what it means to use software. So this is the famed what? A blue screen of death, right? If you ever see this on your Windows PC, it doesn't mean that you messed up. It means that someone at Microsoft or someone who wrote the software or drivers that are installed on your computer messed up and pretty much crashed the computer and crashed it hard. Um, a few years ago, exam one, I forget if I said this already in October, but uh, exam one fell on Halloween. And so we offered students eh, five points of extra credit if you show up, however socially awkwardly, at your exam dressed up in costume. So one of the winners that year <laughs> dressed as a blue screen of death. Um, the man came in with a cardboard box on his head, painted blue with some text on it, and he was a blue screen of death. And he did very well, I think, on the exam. Uh, also familiar, or also funny, certainly, are error messages like this. These are all real. These are not Photoshopped images. This, too, is when someone makes a mistake and prompts you with clearly a complete lack of messages. Here's an error. Again, this is an example of what we call a bug, right? Not so much your fault, but someone else's. Uh, this is a classic. Right? This is one of those situations that maybe you stumbled across when writing your Scratch programs or PBJ programs. You know, if you don't think through all the scenarios, something's going to break. And this is an error in logic, certainly. Um, blue screen of death, not so good when your billboard is running Windows. All right? That is perhaps the biggest and saddest advertisement of Windows you might see on the side of a building. Alt.tv had a computer clearly crash. Perhaps a little more discomforting is when you see it in an airport, when those little arrival departure computers are clearly running Windows at this particular airport. That's not necessarily a good thing. Um, those ticket machines, you'll see a Greyhound or Amtrak, um, the, the machine, even ATM machines, hopefully, most likely not, hopefully not. But a lot of these terminals that don't look like Windows actually are Windows. Even Bloomberg has a version of Bloomberg that runs on Windows. It's just when it's full screen, you don't know that it's Windows underneath the hood. Not saying it's good, not saying it's bad, um, just saying that it's funny when things like that come across, uh, come your way. And this, this is doctored. Someone made this to be cute. Right? PC users among you will know that Control-Alt-Delete reboots your computer. What better uh, peripheral to have than one that does that so terribly easy? Well, on the internet was our lecture four. Um, this is a clip from Slashdot from December of this year 
I thought it was relevant since the title was Spam Volume Jumps 35% in November. This is a remarkable problem. We mentioned spam in 1999, and yeah, you'd get spam once in a while, but spam did not constitute some 8 or 9 out of 10 emails on the internet, which is a gargantuan and scary problem, an expensive problem, certainly. And I mean, how many of you have ever just changed email addresses to avoid spam? Anyone? All right, so a couple, few of you. So that's certainly not an ideal solution. And as the world moves toward relying on email ever more, hopefully we will soon see better technological solutions to this. But does anyone know why this is such a problem in the first place? Like what is the fundamental, if someone at the water cooler tomorrow said, hey, you just finished taking E1, what's with spam? Why is it such a problem? Like, Excellent. So one, it's a cheap form of communication. Sending a million emails doesn't really cost much more than sending one email, if you ignore bandwidth and so forth, especially if the spams are being sent, not just from your own computer, which is very easy to shut you down if you're sending spams from home. Where is a lot of spam coming from these days? So, uh, so um, bots. Um, and zombie machines. So some of you, if you have spyware installed on your computer or just malicious software, among the things this software tends to do these days is not just pepper you with ads and banner ads and so forth, but is to use your computer as a computing resource and churn out spam. In fact, if you ever run like uh, the netstat command at your command prompt, which we didn't do so much this semester, but it's one of those esoteric commands you can type and just see what's going on behind the scenes on your computer. If you see connections uh, originating, if you see a lot of internet connections and you've got no web browsers open, odds are it's because you have a little SMTP server running on your computer. SMTP referring, of course, to outgoing mail. And your computer, unbeknownst to you, is just churning out spam. And the beauty of that approach for spammers is what? If they're using you or these so-called botnets to deliver their spam. It's free. It's free. You're not, they're not paying for the internet access. They're not paying for the CPU cycles. Much, right, they won't get shut down. Right? Imagine if you, the unsuspecting, fairly non-technical person at home, gets shut down by Comcast, as does everyone in your neighborhood, because as you know, Dell survey a year or two indicated that a huge percent, majority of computers, according to their numbers, were infected with some form of spyware. Solution is not just to turn everyone's computer off. It's too large of a problem. And it's a brilliant approach these spammers have taken to using fairly interesting algorithms and distributed network type approaches to just sending you junk mail to random addresses, to specific addresses. And ultimately, this is the result of the internet really is being used these days. Email, the web, for stuff it wasn't intended for. Right? When email was invented, there was no notion of authenticating the origin. There was no protection against who could put, whose address you could put in the from line of an email. In fact, I, all of you could go home tonight and type into the uh, appropriate configuration screen of your email program that you are David Malin at malin at post.harvard.edu and send emails as though you were me. Right? Sign it DJM, who's going to know the difference, frankly? And that is testament to the fact that email just wasn't designed to sort of prevent this kind of problem that we're facing. And so a lot of the solutions that have been offered, including the software you might run on your computer, the stuff your ISP uses, is st it's patching the symptoms. But it would really require some much more clever or really a fundamental redesign of the way things tend to work right now to really get this right. But we're sort of stuck with the way things are. And we can only make incremental improvements. So this was just an article about how spam was increasing ever more just a few months ago. The numbers here is that according to Ironport Systems, from, uh, in, on average in October 2005, there were 31 billion spams sent a day. In November, oh, let's see, on average, yes. So there were 31 billion spams sent per day on average between October 05 and October 06. In November of 06, though, according to these numbers, they saw 85 billion spams sent. That is huge. It is a huge problem. And Fortunately, the course is over. We'll have to see how they figure that one out. Also on the internet, we talked about this. And this image I did steal from our original lecture because most of you have something set up like this at home. And hopefully, too, one of the takeaways from a course like this is that if nothing else, you eventually, you at some point, took our suggestion of unplugging 
all the cables from your computer, or maybe a coworker's computer, and then just plugging everything back together. That alone can be sort of empowering for some people. This we offer, though, is just very representative of the type of stuff that hopefully, after this course, you'd be comfortable setting up and turning on security with these routers, right? Little pop quiz. What type of encryption, ideally, should you be using on your wireless router if you care about the privacy of your data and such? Yeah, so WPA, uh, in contrast to WEP, which some routers still only come with, which simply is not secure, all too easily broken. We had a little surprise in lecture six where we had a few students pitted against a few teaching fellows. Um, that was meant to just reinforce, recall, some of the material from that first exam. Um, multimedia in lecture seven. So what the heck is this? So this is a screenshot from a wonderful hardware site. If you've at all gotten a taste now for what cool hardware is like and like to learn about this stuff, and Gadget.com is a wonderful site that even I've just gotten into this year that um, it, it will make sense in a moment. This was a recent post. It's essentially a blog about the latest and greatest in computer hardware. And the Nintendo Wii, which you may have heard about just shy of Christmas time, was as talked about as the PlayStation 3. Um, the Nintendo Wii, though, is cool because rather than use those sort of old school controllers that have up, down, left, right, A, B, and the newer controllers that have that plus 16 other buttons whose patterns you have to memorize to use, so the Wii uses a controller that ironically has up, down, left, right, A, B, but at least I'm capable of remembering up, down, left, right, A, B. But if you want to move something on the screen, you don't necessarily use up, down, left, right, A, B. You just point. And point here when you want to point here on the screen. Point down when you want to point there on the screen. If you want to play tennis, you don't hold the keys and then hit the left key when you want the player to hit the ball to the left, or the right key when you want the player to hit to the right. With the Nintendo Wii, you go like this. And when the ball's coming to backhand, you go like this. And when you want to serve, you throw the ball up and you hit it like this. It's because this controller has a bunch of accelerometers, as they're called, inside. And these things, Apple's iPhone has accelerometers. And if you saw the keynote, Apple's iPhone is able to detect, if you're looking at the phone, this is not an iPhone, this is a stand-in, it can detect if you're looking at your phone like this or if you're holding it like this. And if you're holding it like this, it shows the screen or the photo or the video as you would expect. And if you turn it this way, it immediately rotates the image too so that you can watch like a widescreen news clip or movie even or whatever you happen to have on your iPod. So Nintendo uses the same type of hardware to detect if my hand is going up, if it's going left, right, if it's twisted this way, twisted that way. And the effect is remarkably powerful. And one of the things we did promise tonight is that we would demonstrate this little toy. Um, this is Dan's Nintendo Wii. And I should fess up that though in that uh, uh, solicitation last night or that teaser email last night about how Dan stayed up for some 10 hours in the parking lot of a circuit city to get himself and his siblings one of these Wiis, so there's also someone else present that night for 10 hours. And I, I'm loath to admit it, because honestly, I never thought I would be, shall we say, one of those people. Um, <laughs> But it was a fun experience nonetheless. Uh, we did foot races around 3 and 4 a.m. to stay warm, because this was in the midst of December. Um, we became friendly with people we don't really know by name, because we knew them by that guy's number one, that guy's number two. I think we were three and four in line, and number five was a cool guy. He was there overnight to getting a wee for his, um, for his um, kids. I think number 10 was a woman with her two daughters who were camped out on like a chair outside of Circuit City until so finally they too went into their cars for a bit. But it was this wonderful, if nothing else, I mean certainly a geek story, but a wonderful sociological experience where you have a whole bunch of people going into this. And mind you, this was in the coming on the heels of those stories where people are getting mugged and attacked online for PlayStation 3s. Right? Sony's release of their hardware didn't go so well. We was much more civil. But here were... <laughs> We showed up at, what, 10 p.m., and it was already dark, right? The employees, the manager said goodbye to us on our way out of the store, and there we were getting settled in for like a 10-hour nap outside of Circuit City. And what was funny was this was one of these main, like, uh, strip mall-type areas in New Hampshire. We were in New Hampshire, of all places, too. Acro literally next door was a Best Buy where there were 24 other such people waiting for Best Buy to open. Apparently down the road there was a Target where you had people camped out there as well. It was quite the place to be on Saturday night. Um, but the result is that we did it for you. And we have this Nintendo Wii to demonstrate and we thought this one is certainly fun, 
But two, I think it really speaks in the spirit of a lot of the things Apple has been doing and other companies, really where technology is going and better user interfaces and better experiences. I mean, the fact of the matter is, these game consoles today, and I make myself sound old when I say this, like, I can't deal with 14 or some odd buttons on these controllers because the game then becomes a uh, project of memorization. Like, what keys do I have to hit if I want to punch the guy this way as opposed to that way? Whereas something like this, just the computers become much more intuitive. And that's precisely in the spirit that this iPhone was released. Now, what about this picture? So um, I think these people should be embarrassed that they're bringing lawsuit against Nintendo for having hurt themselves, supposedly, using the Nintendo Wii for smacking people with these. I've seen pictures of these things lodged in people's expensive TVs, true or not. Um, frankly, I think it's great that Sony's getting all the more attention for these things. Uh, we promise you a safe experience here. We thought we'd take a five-minute uh, fun break, uh, pit a couple of people against each other, and hopefully it won't turn out quite like this. But let me give you our little plug for the Nintendo Wii. And since it is Dan's, let me give controller number one to him. And maybe just to... We'll, uh, we won't ask if you can... If it might be of interest, allow me to challenge Dan to a, a match of tennis. A few points in tennis here. We're going to come up to the crowd. And notice both he and I have these controllers in our hands. You know, as with most things, Though we like to spin this as... Though we like to spin this as uh, a bit academic, this is also a nice excuse for Dan and I to play this on a 20-foot screen. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to pick... Uh, so notice, as I move left-right, my red hand moves. So this is, uh, yeah, pun intended, Wii JM. I should probably go over there then, huh? All right, we're getting a bit of feedback for some reason, but we'll ignore that for now. All right. All right, I, let's go, maybe I'll go up here. All right. All right, so you're number one. What? Well, let's just do the one. All right, so we have two players on a side. So I'm officially, before we begin, don't, don't psych me out here. So before we begin, I'm controlling the right-hand side of the screen, Dan the left, but you're seeing the same image just from different sides of the court. Because I'm just one person, if I, for instance, move my arm, notice that both of my guys are swinging. So the idea is that if the ball is closest to the guy at the net and I swing, he'll hit it. The computer figures out that I want him to hit it. Or if I wait, it'll come to the back of the court and the back guy will hit it as well. So we've got our safety straps on. All right. <laughs> Notice Dan's going to swing. And you can't see this on film, but in a moment, Dan is literally going to throw his arm up and then serve, and then I'm going to ace him back. <laughs> we will be editing the video at that point. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh. Those of you watching the video, Dan just flailed his arms to the side and missed that shot. <laughs> 15 30. So at this point, Dan is losing by one point. <laughs> 15 40. The funny thing is, Dan and I joked for a while that the wager for this would be if uh, I lose, I quit. <laughs> But <laughs> looks like I might be back in 07. Oh! Now, since you've indulged, let me yield my controller and ask who in the crowd would like to take on Dan for a game. Uh, <laughs> Dawn, you've been volunteered. Would you like to come over? All right. It's a good question. Have there been any experiments to compute how many calories people burn doing this? I did see an article recently, which was, thank you, kind of funny that it was on CNN or something too, where the article said that uh, like these physical computer games help kids lose weight, which uh, is sort of a nice rationalization perhaps, but I don't know. I will admit that when 
preparing for tonight's lecture, I broke a sweat several times um, playing tennis here. So Dan is prepped on. Dawn is filling in for Wee JM on the right. 15 love. Dan hit it a little too hard back, but. <laughs> 30 love. <laughs> Okay, Match point. comeback time for Don. I think I heard rematch. Rematch? One rematch? All right. All right, so in this final rematch, we have Don versus Dangerous D. It's tied at 15 all. Thirty-fifteen. Close. Thirty-fifteen. Don, uh, Dan slightly in the lead. And oh, nice. Thirty all, nice. <laughs> Forty thirty. Match point. What a game. The left team wins. So close. A round of applause though if we could for Dodd. Dan has kindly offered to, uh, when we conclude, which will be early tonight, that we'll leave it set up so we can have some more folks uh, give it a shot. So thank you to Dan. I'm, I'm going to get yelled at for having beaten him because we did have sort of an unofficial wager, but uh, 10,000 people just saw that, so let's <laughs> leave it at that. <laughs> so in lecture eight, after multimedia, we looked at security. This is a clip also from Slashdot, which is another one of these wonderful websites if you like to be uh, up on everything current in technology and geekdom. This article is about a Vista zero-day exploit for sale. So one, Vista is referring to Win uh, Microsoft's uh, latest operating system, um, which you may or may not end up having on your computer soon as well. A zero-day exploit, what does this mean? We didn't really spend time on this, but you see it a lot. Zero day exploit. It refers to the amount of time that usually refers to the amount of time after a bug's discovery that it takes for someone else, a bad guy, to figure out how to take advantage of that bug and we, uh, wage havoc on a computer. So in other words, someone discovers, hey, there's this potential bug in Microsoft Vista at 7 a.m. Well, if by 12 p.m. someone's figured out how to use that bug to crash the system or take it over, that's an exploit. And because it happens so fast, it's a zero-day exploit. That's pretty much the simplest explanation. So uh, perhaps unbeknownst to you, um, there is supposedly this whole black market when it comes to bugs in software, especially software that's out, as omnipresent as Windows, um, such that besides just there being opportunities for spam, there's opportunities in taking people's computers over to use them to just cover your tracks. And wage malicious attacks or denial of service attacks against websites, try to steal personal information by taking over people's computers. So attacking the bugs in something like an operating system is perhaps the best way at getting at that. What this particular article is about is uh, says the following. Um, 
Underground hackers are hawking a zero-day exploit for Windows Vista at $50,000 a pop, according to computer security researchers at Trend Micro. The Vista exploit, which has not been independently verified, was just one of many zero days available for sale at an auction-style marketplace infiltrated by the antivirus vendor. Prices for exploits for unpatched code execution flaws are in the $20,000 to $30,000 range. Bots and Trojan downloads that typically hijack Windows machines for use in botnets were being sold for about five thousand dollars so reportedly there are there is this underground market such that if you're gonna make uh, more than fifty thousand dollars off of spam if you're going to make fifty thousand dollars or more off of some scam getting you know emailing a million people and having just 0.01 percent of those people send you their life savings some of these things can be worth it um, so just be aware certainly that these kinds of stories are all over the place today, but they're not so much cause, I think, for paranoia. I mean, the fact of the matter is that practicing, and we sort of make light of it, safe computing is really the best you can do. And the only, you know, the measures that we've certainly proposed in our security lectures were things like, you know, don't check your bank accounts in some internet kiosk at an airport or at some internet cafe elsewhere. You know, anything that's particularly sensitive, at least just use your own computer. And even then on your own computer, just be aware of the possible threats. Run some antivirus software, or run some anti-spyware software. But at the end of the day, truth be told, you can only do so much these days. So you just have to be aware of what's going on with your computer. And for instance, if you notice all of a sudden your computer has gotten deathly slow, well maybe it's running something in the behind the scenes that you don't know about. So maybe it's time to use that, not as cause for concern that I need more RAM, but maybe if this is a differential from the previous day, maybe something's on there that I don't know about. And investigate on your own by you know, any of the te techniques that we've discussed so far. This is a Sort of in that same spirit, Professor Eugene Spafford of Purdue, the only truly secure system is one that is powered off, cast in a block of concrete, and sealed in a lead-lined room with armed guards. And even then, I have my doubts. This is a famous quote that's sort of been altered and butchered over the years and taken up by other people, um, but it is pretty much fact. Right? You know, only if the thing's not on the internet and not turned on and not plugged in and not accessible is it really secure. So it's all about relative risks. And hopefully in this course and through some of the sections and workshops, you'll walk away with some ideas as to at least what reasonable measures you can um, take for yourself. So, okay. Yeah. Let's just proceed. So website development, I'm going to speak more slowly so we can come back to this in just a second. So web things so we gyms I don't know I mean they already have ergonomic machines right where you can pretend to row when you see like a guy you know going on water in front of you right so I've seen something like that but I don't know the point though I suppose is that it's possible now apparently we're back and uh, <laughs> So website development was our lecture 10. So recall we dabbled with this whole Malin Rouge idea, but really the takeaway hopefully from that lecture was, and in your ongoing final projects, uh, you don't mind being reminded, is relatively how easy it is and how cheap it is to get a website up and running. How pretty it looks really is a function of your own design abilities or maybe how much you want to pay someone else to design it for you. But the fact of the matter is, it is relatively easy to do these days. And those web hosts are sort of innumerable on the internet. And DreamHost is the one we've been using. There are certainly others that we've recommended. But it's hard to go wrong, too, certainly for relatively small sites that don't need to deal with a lot of traffic. If you're thinking of launching some company whose website will be its main focus, then you want to do a bit more background checks as to the quality of the service. And honestly, if you're trying to run a major internet company with a $20 web hosting account, that's probably not the right path to go down. But certainly for the personal type websites, Malin Rouge that we discussed in this class, more than sufficient. And you can pay even less than the $20 a month that we're paying if it's really just for your own personal use and for email and such. Apparently, it's peanut butter jelly time, which means that we have one of these internet forwards that I got a long time ago. Don't remember where it came from, but it's our introduction to this demonstration. Oh, this is not... There we go. I don't know what this is or why someone made it, 
But it is peanut butter jelly time. You'll recall that for your problem set eight, one of the programs you had to write was that for making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, something that could be passed to a robot who could execute it verbatim, literally making no assumptions. So what we thought we would do is uh, take a moment to just grade a couple of your problem sets right now. If the teaching fellows wouldn't mind coming down, I just so happened to have dropped by Star Market before class. And it appears, per that problem set, that we have some jelly. We even have some strawberry jelly. A couple more over there. We got some peanut butter. And because we're going to do a nice tie-in with the class afterward, we got whole bunches of bread so that after class you're all going to get a peanut butter and jelly sandwich if you want. Uh, we got split top wheat bread. How about for Ray? Uh, we've got uh, country style 12 grain for Eugenia. Uh, we got uh, old fashioned country 100% stone ground wheat for Dan. And we got white bread for Chris. <laughs> oh, white bread for Dan. All right. So let me uh, turn down the audio here. What I did was took, and we apologize in advance if you see your problem set on the board. It's anonymized, and we do this, we do this because we love and we care. <laughs> Not, don't assume you're going to get a good grade or bad grade just because we happen to pick, for instance, this one. So what I thought we'd do is, since the screen's behind you guys, I'll recite these lines one at a time. And the task at hand for these guys is literally, while grading this in their minds, Execute only what they are told to do, making no assumptions. Let's see what happens. Take one from one of Computer Science E1's Fall 2006 students. First step, locate jars of peanut butter and jelly, a loaf of bread, and a knife. Done. Excellent. One point so far. If customer orders a special sandwich, if only jelly is requested, then dip knife into jelly and spread across bread. So we're going to need, I guess, someone to play the role of the customer. What kind of sandwich? Don, you're, you're, you're staff. What, <laughs> what kind of sandwich would you like? Um, I'd like peanut butter and jelly on um, like split top wheat. Oh, a split top wheat. All right. So we'll take a specific request. So the request is for um, a regular sandwich. So let's skip down to the else block. Sounds like only Ray is on the table right now. If customer orders a regular sandwich, dip knife into peanut butter and spread across bread. <laughs> no, no, peanut butter. <laughs> Little bug. <laughs> okay, dip knife into peanut butter and spread across bread. <laughs> You're glad this isn't your problem set already, aren't you? <laughs> All right, step two. Dip knife into jelly and spread across bread. We'll, we'll do this one nice. <laughs> and all that remains, apparently, is to add another piece of bread. and give it to server. <laughs> OK, so not so good. Shall we try again? Uh, let's try again. How about um, let's do another one. So this one here was from another student. Take two. Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this, let's just, this is an A quality work, <laughs> let's say. Um, this was perhaps has the distinction of being the longest program ever. It's a good two-pager. I think there's several hundred lines. Um, <laughs> It did well, so let's do another take. Um, take two. Okay, you know this will be good. So take two. Well, let's involve all four of them now. Locate uh, jars of peanut butter and jelly, a loaf of bread, and a knife. Then open bag of bread and remove two slices. <laughs> Remove lid from peanut butter jar and jelly jar. <laughs> then, if peanut butter or jelly are empty, 
Okay, they're not. So else. Wait a minute. <laughs> else give up. <laughs> I think that's a real bug. <laughs> okay, let's let's debug. We're gonna skip that line. Step seven. Using knife, spread peanut butter on one slice of bread. You got 10,000 people wondering right now, why, are, what? <laughs> uh, place, uh, using knife, spread jelly on top of peanut butter. <laughs> Maybe we'll go out after class. <laughs> Then, place second slice of bread on top of first. <laughs> this last one's mean. Then, eat. <laughs> How many other people you brought prophylactic gloves tonight? <laughs> <laughs> it's the EMT thing. <laughs> okay, excellent. <laughs> All right, let's try. If our volunteers could restore things to their original state as best as possible, let's try one final take, right? Because if you all find this so funny, let's see how well you can do. Because as I recall, the baby changing, not so good. So... Oh, God. Okay, so to the audience, Dawn and team, step one from you is locate jars of peanut butter and jelly, a loaf of bread, and a knife. And now from someone in the audience, what's step two going to be? Unscrew the lid of the peanut butter and take off any cap. Kind of funny, we made three sandwiches and we're still not at that point over here. <laughs> All right, step three. Unscrew jelly. Riding her coattails. Unscrew jelly lid and remove any cap. All right, step four. Good job so far. Uh, anyone? Open the bag of bread. Open the bag of bread. Untwisting the tie. Untwisting the tie. <laughs> Take out two slices. From the opening. From the opening <laughs> of the bag. Place them on the plate. If it's a heel, discard it. It's fair. If it's and if it's flat, place them flat on plate. Okay. Next step. Take the knife. Lights. Blade side first. Blade side up. And scoop out a er, teaspoon of peanut butter. Put on one slice of bread. Flat. Spread the peanut butter over the top of a. Evenly on the flat side of the bread. If it does not completely cover bread, scoop out more until covered. Peanut butter. Peanut butter. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Approximately one eighth. 
approximately one eighth inch thin. Evenly and pretty. What's that? You can draw a design if you wish. Almost there. What's next? With the other piece of bread? Do the same with jelly. Do, <laughs> you're punting. Do the same with jelly. Sure. Sure. Uh, you can. Yeah. Yeah. Virginia. <laughs> yes. Take second piece of bread from underneath top piece. So that would have to be an, uh, an if statement. Uh, so if what? If, if bread is stacked on top of each other, then you would have to have an if statement. So if bread is stacked on top of each other, take a negative piece and, and put jelly on it. Wait, take what? <laughs> the naked piece of bread. <laughs> the naked piece? <laughs> take the naked piece of bread. <laughs> This is why great sex and other such terms lead to Ewan's website. <laughs> okay, next. Uh oh, you're being reprimanded. <laughs> next. Take us home, almost there. <laughs> Scoop out more jelly. Spread thinly. Spread thinly. On, bread. On bread and pretty. <laughs> Evenly. And repeat the same as with the peanut butter. Repeat the same as with the peanut butter. But on, a slice of bread. on a different slice of bread. Join jelly side and peanut butter side flat together. So that the pieces of the bread line up. Evenly and pretty. Lightly push together. Match edges. So I need one more volunteer, clearly. No? What do you think? Oh, they got you. Eat the sandwich if you wish. Oh, you can. Oh, this will be good. Slice in half. <laughs> Gently. With knife. This guy's work's looking pretty good right now, isn't it? <laughs> All right. Well, that was great. All right. <laughs> Thank you to our volunteer, PBJs and we, at our, at our conclusion here. All right, so um, let's all stay down here. All right, Lecture 12, that's fine. Lecture 12 was Pictionary Recall, which was meant to just reinforce some of the topics from, uh, of course, Exam 2. And it was our first attempt. Clearly, it didn't work so well since I was asking all the terms that you just been quizzed on. Made it a little easy, didn't need that 60-second timer, but... It's, it's an ongoing process here in E1. Lecture 13, just last week, was a film for those of you who attended locally on startup.com. If you did not catch that, I would certainly recommend checking out from Netflix or local store or whatnot. It really is a fascinating documentary, at least, at least in my opinion. Um, what I did offer here is not a screenshot of um, startup.com, was just to put the idea out there, maybe make no particular claim, but this is a news story from just... Uh, October of 06, and you probably know that Google spent an enormous 
enormous amount, $1.6 billion to buy YouTube, which is, of course, this video file sharing website. And I offer this just as food for thought, if only because friends of mine and I certainly have discussions of late about a lot of the attention that companies like Google are getting, and YouTube, and Facebook, and a lot of these sites that are all the rage, you know, numbers one, two, three on the internet and so forth, and yet, other than Google, don't seem to make a whole ton of money. YouTube in particular, $1.6 billion for a site that effectively is free. It's got some ads and so forth, but we I offer this as food for thought as to whether what happened just five, six, seven years ago in the so-called dot-com craze, if its lessons are sort of being quickly forgotten. And perhaps I'll be proved wrong come a couple years from now if Google's investments and such do pay off. But Google in particular is a company that by all means is printing money when it comes to search. But they have dozens of other projects, Google Maps and Earth and so forth, none of which have obvious or necessarily intentional revenue streams. And I think it will be very interesting just to watch as sort of a technological society just how long sort of companies can keep that up and just how long the world, the outsiders, value companies like Google at $500 a share or more or less. It's sort of an interesting thing and I think it'll be interesting to see what the sort of takeaways are in another five years time. If we're sort of forgetting some of the lessons we learned a few years ago when it comes to valuations of companies and actual products and revenue or if perhaps this is something completely different altogether. So. Time will tell. So the exciting conclusion is where we're at here at lecture 14. So computer science E1, understanding computers and the internet, was all about this thing ultimately. And again, do take away, if nothing else, reassurance that not all of this had to go down the first time. Know that the course's lectures and workshops and uh, videos of the week, a lot of the handouts will remain online for a while, certainly on the course's website and in iTunes, but also, as you've seen, on Google Video and on YouTube as well. So if you've missed anything, don't feel that tonight or two weeks' time for now was sort of your last chance. A lot of this content, especially the content that the teaching fellows have put so many hours into this year to make possible, the videos of the week in particular, will long outlive um, um, this course, we hope, and certainly outlive this semester. So, fall 2006's mouse pad, right? After we announce this, uh, do feel free down, to come down and mingle, say hello, gra grab a sandwich, make a. S can we do that? Make a sandwich? All right, we have some things left over. We'll turn back on the Wii, and perhaps Dan will take a rematch against anyone else here, um, as well as the other teaching fellows. Uh, the winner of fall 2006's mouse pad, which we have in this box over here. One for each of you, and for distance students, we will mail these out to you for the other 10,000 of you. Um, not going to have enough, but that is okay. The winner of this year's Fall 2000 mouse pad, which rings in the end of this semester for us, is... <gasps> yeah. That's some Photoshop work. The winner is this, Yay. and how fitting that I survived E1 is imprinted on it. So congratulations to Danielle. So thank you very much. Congratulations. You did indeed survive Computer Science E1. We look forward to seeing your final projects and certainly at some point in the future. So farewell. Come on down for some snacks.